Well, thank you, Paul, for that introduction. It's so great to be back at Emmanuel. We always love to come here. And uh, a lot of times I'm traveling, I have to travel without my wife, but my wife is with me here this morning. So uh, I, she's sitting with the Fritches. There she is. And just wave your hand. I always used to say, look how beautiful she is. But as we get older, she's like, honey, stop telling people I'm beautiful. They see all these wrinkles and, you know, they're like, you know, she's not beautiful, but she is beautiful. Beautiful inside and outside. My uh, oldest grandson told her, he says, uh, I call her Mimi. This Mimi, he says, uh, those aren't wrinkles, they're wisdom tattoos. <laughs> so he, he came up with a really good, uh, we like that, wisdom tattoos. So anyways, good to be here with you this morning. And uh, I really enjoyed the morning, uh, the 9 o'clock hour, to hear all the great reports about what God is doing through the people in your, in your congregation in, in missions, just as God uses you as a body of Christ reaching out to do uh, many things. And uh, so that was, what a blessing, and also a blessing to hear uh, uh, the, the report by uh, Fred and Rachel Whitman. Uh, Jenner and I actually got to go over and be with them a, a number of years ago, uh, I, I did some uh, college and career, uh, uh, I spoke to them, I did a, a youth outreach there, and uh, we saw their brand new building, they have this new building is, that seats uh, a couple hundred people, and, and the thing, it was almost full. So God is doing a great work there over in, in uh, uh, Italy there through Fred and Rachel, and you can, uh, that, you know, wow, think how many years they've been there since 1973. And such a blessing. It's even kind of neat as I saw Fred there. I remember when he came as a student from Baptist Bible College to my home church and talked about why you need to come to BBC. And I was like, wow, uh, you know, Fred was going to be a, a, a pastor. And I was like, I want to be a pastor. And so uh, God used Fred to, to kind of recruit me to Bible College. So uh, all that has been such a blessing to me. Uh, one thing I, I do want to share about our ministry uh, we want to thank you, Jenner and I want to thank you for your support so that we can do our ministry. And one of the exciting things that's happening just lately is uh, the ministry with the refugees in Germany. And uh, I know a lot of you have prayed for the building to be finished there in Kuzel. We're just about finished with it. Uh, we're already using the bottom floor. And uh, we're ta we took the old building. Uh, we wondered, what, what are we going to do with this old church building? And we turned it into apartments for... The refugees, a lot of these refugees from Iran and Afghanistan have come to Germany, and 600 of them were brought to the city of Kuzel and just dumped there. And uh, most of the people, uh, the Germans are like, oh, we don't like this, you know, the refugees, and they just kind of withdrew and, and uh, isolated themselves from them. But uh, the church there in Kuzel reached out to these people and I want you to know that 45 of these Muslim refugees have come to Christ. They've been saved. And uh, not only that, but 20 more have come to Christ and are now waiting to be baptized, okay? So we've already baptized 45, 20 more waiting to be baptized, and a new Bible study has been started with 15 more that are seeking Christ. So... Anyways, uh, your prayers and your gifts have really helped this, this outreach. And uh, Now, my son is uh, pastoring in a, 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 a city about 20 minutes from Kuzel, and uh, his church is growing too, and so we praise the Lord for that. He's had a lot of great things happen in his church. They're looking for a new building, so you can pray for that. Anyways, before I get into the message, I wanted to just share some of the blessings that we've seen in, in our ministry there too. So... All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians, if you would, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be looking at chapter 3 this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. For many years, 2 Corinthians seemed to be a very boring book to me. It's like, you know, Paul is defending his apostleship, and so... To me, it was like, oh, he's got this battle going on with these Corinthians about, you know, are you really an apostle? And he's kind of defending his apostleship, and 
uh, some other people had gone in and influenced the congregation that, you know, hey, Paul's not really a real apostle. You know, we're really better apostles. We're, we're super apostles. We have more gifts. You know, we're better speakers. We're, you know, but the fact is, Paul is the one that had started the church there in Corinth. He had led these people to the Lord. You'll wonder how something like that could happen, but if you're in the ministry long enough, you'll, you, you'll, you'll see that things like that can happen. But Paul is like, you know, he's defending his authenticity that God has called him and that God is using him. You know, as, as I think about how we in America, uh, as Christians, you know, it used to be we were kind of... Uh, if you, if you declared in America that you were a Christian, you were respected. You know, they were like, wow. You know, I remember when, as a young man, back in the, the 60s, the mid-60s, I got saved. And, and about a year after I was saved, I felt called to preach. And I would start telling people, uh, uh, when I grew up, they like, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a pastor. And like, wow. Ooh. Ooh. You're really special. What a great guy, you know, that you would follow God. There was kind of a respect for religion, for, for following God, of being a person of faith. Today, those things are changing. Uh, one of my sons who's a pastor, uh, I have a couple sons who are pastors, and one of them we went to a, a session and uh, some kind of seminar and went to this uh, workshop there and about millennials. And he said uh, uh, one of the things that they, they took a... Uh, a survey of millennials and 43 percent of millennials think that the church is a detriment to a good life in america 43 percent says the church is an enemy of america that's the kind of thing that's starting to happen now I, again used to be a person of faith they respected you now we're kind of held suspect you know we we used to be like wow look at all the churches now it's like oh you know, they're the ones that are really messing things up. And so we're, we're kind of going through a sense of authenticity. Are we the real thing? Are we really hurting America? Do we really need to get rid of religion? And so sometimes, you know, as we think about, we have a missions conference reaching out to other nations. I'll tell you what, you as a congregation have a, a, an obligation. You have a project. You have a mission to reach out to Toledo to bring them to Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, we are fast becoming uh, a nation that is no longer Christian. Maybe in a sense in word, but not in reality. We're actually becoming post-Christian, just like uh, 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 Europe is today. When Jenner and I go over there to minister, we find that religion, uh, they, they, they declare like, yeah, we're kind of, yeah, quote, Christian, but they don't ever practice it or believe it. In, in essence. And we, I think we're becoming at it. So in the same way that Paul is trying to defend his authenticity, that the message I have is what you need, and that I truly am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm someone that God has commissioned, as it says in the, 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 the last part of chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, as I've been commissioned by God to take the gospel. And we have too. Amen? Well, we might be, because we're kind of, you know, intimidated by the world today. You know, it seems like all the smart people, you know, all the smart people, they don't believe in God. You know, it's only, you know, people that don't have intellect, you know. They're getting, oh, yeah, you believe in God. He's your crutch, you know. You know what I usually say to people like that? Like, no, God is in my crutch. He's my wheelchair, you know. I mean, I really need God to carry me, Amen. And so, but sometimes we might feel intimidated. Young people, I know especially, you know, uh, you might be feel like, you know, uh, you know, I know when I was in school and became a, a Christian, and I went to science class, and, and the teacher definitely believed in evolution, and, and here I'm trying to be like, you know, uh, uh, you believe in creation? Is there any room for creation? No, <laughs> you're so stupid. And so that intimidation factor when we claim to be Christians, and it seems like, you know, anyways, this morning I'd like to talk about three credentials as we look at Second, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 3, as Paul gives his credentials 
why he is authentic. I want to give us three credentials that the Holy Spirit is giving us that will give us boldness to present the gospel. If you're taking notes, I want to talk about three credentials the Holy Spirit is giving us that will give us boldness to present the gospel. I want us to look down, first of all, we'll go back to verse 1, but I want us to look down, there's a, there's a conclusion uh, in the first 11 verses as we read verse 12 of 2 Corinthians, it says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Since we, are, since we have such a hope, and so the first 11 verses have these three paragraphs that give us these three credentials, okay? And we'll go over those. And then the conclusion is, since we have this hope and these things that the Holy Spirit has given us, we are very bold to, to, to share the Scriptures and to share the Gospel. So anyways, let, let's look at these three paragraphs and look at these credentials, okay? Verse 1, let's go back to verse 1. <clears throat> Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Again, this is Paul defending his apostleship. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Here's the first credential. I think we will have credentials to be bold, number one, when we participate in the preciousness of the gospel. When we participate in the preciousness of the gospel. Paul is appealing to them as a brother and as someone who led them to Christ. He goes, you know what? Do I need a letter of recommendation for you, to you? He goes, you're my letter of recommendation. I led you to Christ. He says, you're a letter written on my heart. He says, listen, you're precious to me. I saw you come to Jesus Christ. And can I tell you what? I don't think there's anything that gives more credential than if God has used you to bring someone to Jesus Christ. When you have those letters that God has used you to write through the Holy Spirit. And so the, 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 the first credential is that the Holy Spirit is trying to work in you. He's giving you a heart for the gospel. I, you know, I don't know about you. When I got saved, I was ready to tell the world. Now, let me share it with you very briefly here for some that might be here that don't know the gospel. The gospel, and Paul is kind of alluding it to here, is it's so different than keeping the law. He says, listen, the letters that the Holy Spirit writes, the letters that God is writing, is the letter that's written on fleshly tables of the heart, not written on stone tablets, you know, like the law. You see, when I was a young boy, I grew up in a church that kind of was like, you know, hey, do your best, try really hard. In fact, you got a head start in the fact that you're going to church. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, I'm, you know, I, I went to a, I was in a home that was so strict about going to church. We never missed church. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I don't ever remember missing a Sunday because of snow. Okay? I mean, I remember my mom barreling through the snow in that old Chevrolet, you know, in first gear, you know, banging through the snow drifts, you know, like, we're going to church, you know, I'm like, I'm going to heaven for sure. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. I remember driving by and seeing the neighbor bailing hay on Sunday. I'm like, he's going to hell for sure, you know. He's not keeping the Sabbath. Now, you know, so I think I stand a pretty good chance. I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. And uh, thou shalt not kill. I never killed anybody, never killed anybody, you know. I, I feel like it, but... Uh, and. Uh, but remember, Jesus said, you know, if you hate somebody in your heart, it's like you've killed them. But you see, I had a whole, this idea that if I, if I do good, if I, if I keep the Ten Commandments, if I go to church, if I act like a Christian as much as I can, I perhaps stand a chance. That's not the gospel. 
The gospel simply means good news. The good news, when I was 15 years old, I went to camp. And the preacher said, now I know you're trying to do good, but he says, you can't do it. He says, I'll bet you, you know, you kids swear and your parents don't know about it. I'm like, well, yeah, you know, when I'm out in the barn, I do swear at those cows. You know, and I come in the house, I'm like, hello, mother, what's for supper, you know? And I, I present myself so nice, you know, but in the barn, I'm this raving maniac swearing the cows, beating them with sticks, you know? And, and uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I realize, yes, I swear. And, that preacher said, I'll bet you some of you are into pornography. I'm like, oh, I'm really into pornography. And, you know, and boy, the guilt of the law came upon me. Can I tell you what? You're not going to heaven by keeping the law. And I'm like, I'm lost. Uh, that preacher went on, and he named every one of my sins. And I'm like, I, I, I can't keep the Ten Commandments. I've tried, you know, and not taking the, na- the Lord's name in vain. I do that, and, and I do all that. You know, oh, God, I'm... You know, God, what, what can I do? And the preacher said, but wait a minute. You can't work your way to heaven. It's a gift of God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And all of a sudden, I had this hope welling up inside of me. You mean I could be converted? You know, I, I, I thought conversion was for people down in the bad section of town, drunks laying in the gutter. They needed to be converted, but, you know, I keep the Sabbath holy. And boy, that God showed me, no, you need it too, Ken Rudolph. You need the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Christ on the cross. And I saw it. And the Holy Spirit whispered to me, you can't do it. I'm like, I know I can't do it. He says, Jesus did it for you on the cross. Accept that. And that night I accepted the forgiveness of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he washed me white as snow. That's the good news. And that's the good news that Paul brought to the Corinthians. And he was like, listen, you can't keep the law. Remember, he went to the Jews first, who they were the ones that knew the law. And he said, by keeping the law, there is no forgiveness of sins. He said, it comes through Jesus Christ. And, and those people got saved. They saw it. They, and, and so their forgiveness, that salvation came by the writing of these letters on, their, on human hearts. On flesh, written not with ink, but with the finger of God, the Holy Spirit. And He did that to me. And man, when I got saved, when I had the forgiveness, when I realized what the gospel is, like, I want to give the gospel to others. I want that. And, and so, man, I started going to school. I told my friends about it. I'll never forget the first uh, time I, you know, I wasn't a very good athlete, but I was on the chess team, okay? And we went on a conference. And uh, I remember taking my Bible, you know, and I wanted to be a good testimony. And, uh, and uh, we, there was three of us in a room there at this hotel, you know, as we went to this chess tournament. And, and uh, I remember being there, opening my Bible, and these other two guys just staring at me like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm reading my Bible. And they said, why do you read your Bible? And I, I'm like, oh, here it goes, you know. And I'm like, okay, God. You know, I said, well, you know, you can't work your way to heaven. I just found that out. And uh, by going to church, that doesn't mean anything. They're like, really? And, and I shared with them, and I remember I got to the end of presenting the gospel as well as I knew how to do it as a 16-year-old young boy, and I, I got to the end of it. I said, by the way, Francis, the guy that was listening to me, Francis, would you like to receive Christ? And he goes, yeah, I would. Whoa, really? I wrote a letter! Woo! I've got a letter! Boy, there's nothing like that, amen? The, the tenderness, the, 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 the preciousness of writing those letters, the preciousness of the gospel. Oh, you have authenticity. You have those credentials when God uses you. I remember I went home and I told my mom, Mom, I saved the kid. She goes, you didn't save him. God led him to the Lord. You led him to the Lord. I'm like, oh, whatever. You know, I didn't know the language back then. But I, was, I, I thought I saved him, you know. And, uh, but you know what? Oh, that, the, do you have letters? Do you have letters? I'll, I'll never forget when I became a pastor and I was like, God, I, I really want, I want to be a real pastor. I want to lead people to Jesus. And I remember with, with this one uh, uh, Sunday after church, we got a bunch of our people together. We had a really small church. We we're like, we want to grow and we want to see people saved. And, and uh, we, we sent, uh, after we had a church dinner and afterwards we went out as, couples as families and we went knocking on doors and 
And one of my, my uh, uh, guys in my church, he says, Pastor, I'm really burdened for Pimmon Hills. I'm like, okay, you go to Pimmon Hills. And, and that very morning, a young couple that had been trying to keep the law, they, 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 they said, you know, the church we're going to just doesn't give us anything, and we're empty, and, and uh, you know, by going to church, we're not getting anything out of it. And that morning they woke up to go to church and they, they said, that you, we're not, he, the, the, the husband said, I'm not going to church anymore. He said, it just doesn't speak to me. And he said, we need a church that's going to really minister to us. So they got on their knees and they're like, God, send us someone that can tell us what church to go to. They, were, they lived in Pimmon Hills. And that afternoon one of our members knocked on their door. They opened the door and said, hi, we're from Charity Baptist Church. And they looked at each other, and they're like, well, that was fast. <laughs> you don't think the Holy Spirit is working? You don't think there's people in Toledo that have empty hearts and are searching? And they knocked on, and they said, yeah. We, well, they said, come to Charity Baptist Church. They started coming. I, they told me the next Sunday, they said, wow, we got to tell you this story. Your people came and knocked on our doors, and, and we, you know, we let them, in, uh, let them in, and they gave us... The, the address, and we're here this Sunday. And so I'm like, ooh, I'm preaching the gospel. So I preached the gospel that Sunday. They came back the next Sunday. I preached the gospel again, and they didn't come forward. I preached the gospel the third Sunday. After the fourth Sunday, I said, that's it. I'm going to their house. And I said uh, on the way out for the fourth Sunday, I said, Jamie, the Wheelers, Jamie and Linda Wheeler, I said, Jamie, can I come to your house? I'd like to talk to you. He goes, yes, we'd like you to come to our house. And I went to their house. And I sat down, I remember coming in and, and, and in the living room, and I said, well, I said, well, I'm going to cut to the chase. I said, Jamie and Linda, you've heard the gospel. I've been preaching the gospel. I said, I think you need to be saved. They're like, we were hoping you'd ask us that. They said, we want to get saved. I was like, okay. And they said, well, can we kneel down on the ground? I'm like, yeah, you know. I said, yeah, you know, I'm sorry I didn't, uh, you know, suggest it in the first place. So we knelt down there, and Jamie... And then they got saved. It was 36 years ago. This past week, they called us to talk to us. They said, Pastor, remember when you came to our house? You led us to Jesus. I'm like, I sure do. They said, yeah, you were the one that led us to Jesus. But I said, can I use you for, in my sermon this Sunday, I'm going to be preaching as a letter written with a finger of God, the Holy Spirit. And they're like, oh, you can use us anytime you want. Jamie is a deacon in that church. They've been going there for 36 years. Can I tell you what? There's nothing like the preciousness of the gospel that will give you authenticity and that credential from the Holy Spirit to be bold, to speak to others. I want to ask you, do you have any letters? Do you have any letters that you could say, say God, you, you used me. You used me through the Holy Spirit to write these letters. Can I tell you what? I don't know how many are here this morning, 600, 800, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I bet you there's 800 letters that could be written in the hearts of people all over Toledo that need Jesus Christ. Amen? And I'll tell you what, the world may be saying, oh, well, it's not real. But I'll tell you what, when the Holy Spirit writes the letter, it's real and it works. Amen? And you can be bold because you know the Holy Spirit is doing the writing. That leads me to my second credential that the Holy Spirit wants to give us to be bold. Let's read verses 4 and following. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Number two, we will have the credentials to be bold when, number two, when we realize our own limitations in presenting the gospel. Number two, when we realize our own limitations in presenting, 
in presenting the gospel. Paul says, listen, you know, we're not bragging or anything. We're, we're not competent of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. I know a number of years ago this became one of my life verses. I've had about three life verses over the span of my life, and at different times something means a little bit more to me. And this is my second uh, life verse that God gave me. Not that we are verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, not that we are competent of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, for our sufficiency is from God. We're not sufficient. You know what? God started showing me when I was a younger pastor. He says, you know what, Ken Rudolph? You're not as cool as you think you are. You're not very, you know, he says, you aren't sufficient of yourself. You know, a lot of times we think only these super Christians can be witnesses. Someone who's got a dynamic testimony, like, you know, I, I used to sell drugs on the street, and I killed people, you know, and, and then I got saved and reformed. You're like, whoo, boy, can you testify? And you're like, oh, I got saved when I was six, you know, and my mother came in, it was a thunderstorm, and I was like, and I was like, I'm scared of the thunder. And my mom's like, you, you, you need Jesus, okay. And you're like, you know, it's such a wimpy testimony. And I'm not very sufficient, you know. And I'm not super. Well, you know what? God started showing me, he says, Ken, you don't have much going for you. So the Holy Spirit's going to have to do a lot in you just to make you sufficient. You know what? I'm like, after a while, I started saying, God, I just want to be a sufficient pastor. You know, I don't think I could ever be a super pastor. I don't think I could build a big church. I don't think I could do, you know, some of the great things that I've seen some great men of God do. And I was like, but God, it, it takes all I have to be sufficient. I remember when I worked construction before I went into the ministry. God had put me in a construction job. Uh, I was trying to get a church as a pastor. No one would take me. And uh, uh, so I was working construction, and, and God started showing me. He says, I gave you this construction job because you're a quitter. And he gave me a boss that really beat on me. You know what I mean? He'd make us work in the rain. He was like, it's raining. Can we go home? He goes, no. And he's like, you've you got to be tough. And I remember he, I, 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 uh, I wasn't good enough to lay block I wasn't that skilled and so I mixed the mud and he's like okay I want you to mix the mud so I stood there like a good cook you know and I'm just you know making mud. he goes what are you doing I'm like I'm making the mud he goes well you got to do more than just make mud he's you got to carry block and you got to build scaffolding and I'm like <laughs> by myself you know and he goes yeah and he put I'm like I can't do it I can't do it you know and he's like work harder work harder and I had to start going to God I'm like God I can't do what this guy wants me to do. I'm so weak and I'm so helpless. I'm, I'm, and God's like, yes, I don't call very many mighty men after the flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, when Paul reminds the Corinthians, look at your calling. God doesn't call very many mighty, not very many wise, not very many, not very many noble. And I started looking at that verse. I'm like, that's me. I can hardly carry block. I can hardly mix mud. But I remember how God just, he's, he's like, Ken, you are not super. I have to work on you just to be sufficient. And I had to pray, God, I want to be a good, I want to be a good laborer. I want to be a good laborer. And I remember after about two years working for this guy that just pushed and pushed, man, I'm mixing mud. I'm carrying block. I'm building scaffolding. I'm striking the wall. I'm doing all that. And I'm, I mean, I had to run. I had to hustle. I had to pray every morning for strength. But I remember my, as I'm running by my boss, he was laying up corners in this one building we were building, and, I'm, and he grabbed me by the arm, and he says, what are you doing? I'm like, I, yeah. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm trying. He goes, no, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm mixing mud. I'm carrying block. I'm building. He says, I told you so. He said, I told you that's what you ought to be doing. And I'm like, man, it takes everything just for me to be sufficient. And, and the apostle Paul says, listen, I'm not saying I'm a super apostle. He says, my sufficiency comes from God. When we realize our own limitations in presenting the gospel, I'll tell you what, so, some of you are like, I don't know if I could witness. I'm not a, 
I, I remember going to a pastor's conference one time with this guy. He, he built this church, man. He started it in four weeks. He had like 400 people. I mean, this guy was amazing. And I went to a conference. I rode in the car with him one time, and he stopped to get gas. And uh, the guy come up back, back when they used to pump gas, you know, and, and this guy come out to pump the gas, and he had this you know, little sign uh, uh, on his shirt, you know, Noah. And this guy, this pastor that was, you know, this guy, great church planner, he, he like, says, Noah, he said, that's a good Bible name. And the guy's like, really? Yeah. And he goes, you know, and you know, and before I know it, he says, hold my hand. He leads him to Christ. I'm like, whoa, I'm going to try that next time. Went to the gas station. The guy had Jim on there. I'm like, Jim, I said, you know, there's a book in the Bible named James. He said, shut up. <laughs> okay. Didn't work for me. Man, I'm not one of these super guys that is. I don't know how to lead. Some of your sinners say, I don't, I don't know how to lead. You know, you might have gone through all the training, how to lead someone to Christ. You're still like, I'm a bumbling, fumbling, but you never know. One time I remember preaching, I was at a camp, and I preached a message on David and Goliath. I preached on David and Goliath. I didn't even mention the gospel. It was just one of the nights when I was talking about Christian character or something, and, and uh, uh, a couple months later, this Christian school asked me to come and do their graduation. And uh, so I went and spoke at the graduation, and, and uh, be, these, all these graduates got up to give testimony. He says, well, Ken Rudolph was at camp, and he preached on David and Goliath, and I got saved. I'm like, you can't get saved with that message. <laughs> but you never know what God's going to use. When the Holy Spirit, you see, the letter kills. If we, if we try to do it through... The, the law, like just, just dig down deeper and try hard. No, can I tell you what? It's written with the finger of God, the Holy Spirit. And because the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. Amen? And some of you are sitting and saying, I don't know if I can do it, but, but let me tell you what. When God takes over, when he gives you the ability, you know it's of God. And I remember one, I think I've told you this illustration before when I've been here and preached before, but I'll never forget as I'm realizing I'm not a super pastor. I, I just want to be sufficient. And I said, God, I, I need, you know, I just want to lead someone to Christ. And this is even before Jamie and, and uh, Linda Wheeler got saved. And it was Easter Sunday morning. And I've been praying, God, you know, you're going to have to bring someone and the church and these, these two young couples came walked into our church and like I said it was a small church and all my people are staring at them I'm like you know hey you know the pastor a visitor I'm like act normal just act normal you know <laughs> calm down and I remember and again not a great preacher but preaching the gospel I gave the gospel and I gave an invitation never expecting them to walk forward and these two young couples get out of two of all four they come out and stand up front i went down i said what do you guys want <laughs> they said you said to come up here if we want to get saved i'm like really <laughs> and i'm like oh just sufficiency not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves but our sufficiency of god and i remember taking them back in this little room on the side of the and leading them to jesus and after that, they're like, can we have a Bible study in our home? You want a Bible? Yeah, we can do that too. And can we bring our evil friends? I'm like, bring your evil friends, you know. And they started getting saved. Can I tell you what? It wasn't a super church, but I'll tell you what. We saw people get saved, and I'm like, God, the sufficiency is from you. I can't do it. And some here are like, I don't think I could ever be used by God to bring someone to church and get saved. You never know because the sufficiency is of God and not you. So don't look at yourselves. Look at him. That's your credential. Is when we realize our limitations of presenting the gospel and we let the Holy Spirit do it. That leads me to the third credential, 
that the Holy Spirit is trying to give us so that we can have boldness in presenting the gospel. And that's in the next few verses here, starting in verse 7. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For, what was bring, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Now, this part, portion of Scripture is Paul's going back to the law. And he's saying, remember when Moses went for the second set of the Ten Commandments? And he went up and he, and he told God, he said, God, I want to see your glory. He said, I've been having a rough time. I got the first Ten Commandments, came down, they're worshiping a golden calf. He said, you know, I had to destroy the calf, grind down the gold, mix it with water and make the people drink it. <laughs> it's you know, been a rough day. God's like, come back, get another, a second set of commandments. He goes, okay, but he says, this time, you know, w will you please go with us? Because God was like, I've had enough. I'm not going with you to the promised land. He goes, no, would you go with us? Okay, I'll go with you. And he says, and then can I see your glory? It's like, you know, can I have some, you know, pizzazz in my walk? You know, I, and God's like, well, if you see my glory, you saw my, if you see the fullness of my glory, I'd kill you. But he says, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand, and as I pass over, I will declare unto you all my goodness, and I'll let you see my back. I'll let you see just a glimpse of my glory. So that's what Moses did, and he heard God's goodness, and God spoke to him, and he comes down with the second set of commandments, doesn't realize that because he spoke face to face with God, that his skin was shining with his glory. And he comes down, you know, hey, everybody, and all that. <laughs> the people are like, Whoa! And they all run away, like, ah! And he goes, hey, hey, what's the matter? Your face is glowing. Oh, I've been with God. Okay, now, here's what Paul is saying. Now, if that glory, if that glory was so great that the people, you know, oh, they could, he says, just think when the gospel comes into your life the gospel he says now you know that which was of god or the, the the law that was a fading glory that faded away you know after time he says moses had to put a veil over said after a while it went away he says now if that was great glory so that the people they couldn't handle it just think of what happens when jesus christ comes into your life with the new covenant the not not the ministry of condemnation but the ministry of righteousness not the ministry of death but the ministry of life when that comes into our lives when that comes into a congregation when you represent the gospel of jesus christ what glory should the whole world see amen he says listen i'll tell you what if you have jesus christ in your life don't be afraid to step out into this world and be a testimony for Jesus Christ. He says, you don't have to put a veil. He says, the, the glory of your life, the glory of Jesus is reflecting upon you. And so, we read in verse 12, since we have such a hope, since we have these hopes that the Holy Spirit is working in you to give you sufficiency, the Holy Spirit is working in you to write letters on others' hearts so that you can experience this preciousness of the gospel in your own life and he said thirdly he says if you since we have this hope that the glory of the gospel is much more glorious than what we read about back in exodus 33 and 34 he said if this is true then seeing that we have such hope we are very bold let's read verse 13 then not like moses who would put a veil over his face so that the israelites might not, might, may not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, wherever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, 
can I stop right there for a minute? Can I tell you what? There's a lot of people in America, in Toledo, that are, they're thinking, if I just keep the Bible, if I keep the laws of the Bible, if I keep the Ten Commandments, then I, maybe I'll go to heaven. The veil, there's a veil over their hearts. They can't see the truth. And, and that's what was happening to my heart. Even though I went to church every Sunday as a young boy, I thought if I just do my best, you see that veil, the darkness of the law, because no man can keep the law. Now can I tell you, the law is good, Paul says. The law is good and righteous and just. But no, why did God give us the law? To show us you can't live the perfect life. That's the good news. But a lot of us, we still have this veil. A lot of people out here in the communities, nobody is darkening. The walls of a church. Why? Because they think I'm better than those people. Those, they're hypocrites, anyways, and they got a sense of the law. They that it there's a veil that's over their hearts. Yes, to this day, whenever let's read verse 15 again. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Amen? We can't do it. We can't do it. But God can do it. Oh yeah, there's a veil that lies over the hearts of people. Hardly anybody understands the gospel. I was in a church to the age of 15, did not understand the gospel, and then God opened my eyes. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed, and that veil was removed in my heart. And then I said, God, I want everybody to have that experience. I want everybody to know Jesus Christ. And I hope that's what's beating in your heart, the joy that, G that Jesus Christ has brought to your life and your heart, to know the truth that you're going to heaven, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you're, you're working hard to keep the law. No, no man can do that. It's because it's a free gift. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I hope that one of the things you'll realize today is that you have these credentials. That the Holy Spirit is trying to give you these credentials if you don't have them. Let God use you. You know, do you ever go to a basketball game and sit in a crowd and, 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 and you represent, your, your team represents you, and the fact is that, that your team has won every game, and you got these great players, and, and there's, there's a collective spirit because your team is successful and good, and you get together, and you're like, yeah, you were, and you'll drive miles together in buses to go and, and be spectators of your team, and there's this collective dynamic spirit that just comes because you're all like, yeah. And that's what I think he's talking about. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And when we all realize these credentials that we have, Paul says, listen, I'll tell you what. He says, I, I don't have credentials of myself. It's from the Spirit of God. And he says, as I look into the face of Jesus Christ, as I learn about him day by day, he says, the Spirit is, is giving me the glory of Christ from one degree of glory to another, day by day, God is working in this congregation to bring a glory that, the, that the, the community cannot resist. They cannot deny that God is doing something here. And just like a, 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 a congregation would follow a basketball team because they're the winners, I'll tell you what, we win in Jesus Christ, amen? And we ought to be coming together. And, and I do sense a good spirit when I come to this church, a spirit of togetherness. But when I, I'll tell you, when I went to camp and I sat with those kids and they're all singing songs and no adult supervision, it's not like the adults saying, sing, you little brats, you know. They're, you know, they're all just, uh, you know, singing, we're so happy and here's, the, and I'm watching this. I'm like, these kids want to sing. And they, got, and they wanted to come to chapel and they wanted to open their Bibles and I'm like, what's going on here? Something's different. It was the Spirit of God bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to my heart. And I pray that that will happen 
to your congregation, that you would be missionaries here in Toledo, that you would be the ones like God, you know, maybe the world might doubt the authenticity of Jesus Christ, but I want to show them through my life the letters that are written, the sufficiency that comes from the Holy Spirit, and the glory that comes from the presentation of the gospel. I want to make a difference. So let's, let's pray that God will do that. Give us those credentials of the Holy Spirit and uh, that we can preach the gospel and have that boldness.